Now let's go to the Gospel of John, please. And let's read a promise that is given to us here. And let's apply that today because we're going to go back and look at some very basic things beginning in the book of Genesis. And we are going to see that there is an awful lot there. I remember making the comment some time ago, I wonder what it would have been like to hear a sermon by the Apostle Paul going into the Old Testament to tell us and show this, that, and the other thing that is there. So uh, let's hear, come here to John 14, and here's here's a promise that is given that the Holy Spirit will do for us. John 14 and verse 26, And the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things. Now that's quite a promise, isn't it? If we have the Holy Spirit of God, which we do, and if we're yielding to God and trying to live by every word of God, will the Holy Spirit teach us all things? That is, that we need to know for salvation. It's not going to teach us all information in the world, obviously. It doesn't mean that. And bring to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now, that can't happen to us because we didn't hear the words of Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 16 and verse 13. Here's another promise concerning the Holy Spirit. Howbeit when he, and that should actually read it, or that one would be the correct translation, the spirit of truth is come, it will guide you into all truth. So there is a special blessing that comes when we really take God at his word, study his word, and add precept upon precept. So here's a tremendous promise given to us. So if we follow the word of God, and we do put line upon line here a little, there a little, and put it together correctly, here's a promise. He will guide you into all truth. And the Greek there means all the truth. Now notice, continuing on, for it shall not speak of itself, but whatsoever it shall hear, that shall it speak and will show you things to come. So this is the thing that is necessary for us to understand concerning uh, how we're going to understand the truth. And I think we're going to understand this even more in relationship to the very beginning parts of the Bible. Now let's go to Luke, the 24th chapter, Because here's something else that we add to the knowledge of the Scriptures, and I think this is very, very profound. I think it's also most comforting and understanding when Jesus gave this promise here in Luke 24 and verse 44. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you. And of course, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance all things that he said, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Now, we've seen and we've experienced this from time to time a little bit as we're going along step by step by step. And I've been working on the publication, The Grace of God in the Bible, and and there's one thing that I've learned with writing. You have to get in it, and you have to really have your mind concentrating on it and be able to know uh, the things that are there. So what I've been doing... I've been writing concerning the grace of God in the Old Testament. And it's brought out some very interesting things and helped me clarify and helped me understand even the first part of the Bible even more. So I guess 
when we get down to it, we will have to say that you never know anything the way that you really ought to truly know it. So what I did, since we have, thanks to Carl Franklin making copies of it for us, we have uh, the linear translation of the Hebrew Old Testament with the King James and Revised by George Ricker Berry. Now, we've checked out, and unfortunately, he did not do the whole Bible. He just did Genesis and Exodus. However, I think in there, there's quite a bit that we can learn. Now, this is going to help us also understand more about how important the Sabbath is right at a time when people are throwing away the Sabbath. It's almost a a dichotomy that is unreal. So let's go back. Let's take the literal translation of the Hebrew, uh, literal translation. And let's begin in Genesis 1 and verse 1. Now what I did, I expanded this in size so it is readable. The original text is 20% smaller. Now there's something that that is going to make it just a little difficult in following along, and that is that the English must be read from the right to the left, rather than from the left to the right. With a literal translation in linear form, it must be done that way because Hebrew is read from the right to the left. And we're going to see some just little different but profound translations of different words that really mean more to it. We're going to go into other sections of the Bible as we are going along. But let's read from the English, from the inner linear. And so I'll try and get it at such a pace that you can understand it. You will also see that the verb in Hebrew is put before the subject. Just to make a clarification, King James Version on the left, revised on the right, and then his translation, George Ricker Berry's translation, in the middle. Now, if it's a little too hard for you to follow along, then you can follow along with the King James or the revised version, either one. The purpose of this is because there are several sections which are important for us to know and read and understand. So let's begin in verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. Now let's understand something that's important, which is this. God had to be before the beginning. Is that not correct? If God were not before the beginning, then God would be the beginning. As you will notice when we're going through here, there may be some changes in your notes in your margin of your Bible, as someone just pointed out. There is only one real, the beginning, in relationship to us and what the Bible reveals to us. That is the beginning. Some people have put down their a beginning trying to indicate that there was a beginning before the beginning. But you cannot have a beginning before the beginning, otherwise the beginning is not the beginning. You have one beginning, and you may have subsequent renewals. You may have subsequent changes. You may have subsequent additions. But there is only one, the beginning. Okay, let's go on. Let's go on. The reason it is it is justified in the minds of some by saying a beginning, because some people have in mind that there was a beginning before the beginning of the heaven and earth as we know it. However, in this particular case, it is not talking about this, as we will see. Let's look at some other scriptures concerning the beginning. And John is the one who does this. 
Now, I'm going to go in a little more detail on this later on when I go through a very thorough word-by-word analysis of the Gospel of John, the first chapter. But let's go to the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Because there are only three places in all of the Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, which talks about in the beginning. Now, here in the Gospel of John, we find it is not a beginning, but the beginning. And this is very important for us to understand concerning the nature of God. I will give a little detail here, and at a later time I will amplify it even more. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, the importance that we need to understand is this. In the beginning, and it could actually read here, before the beginning. I don't want to get in too much detail with the Greek here. Was the Word. Now, why did he have to be in existence before the beginning? Because he's the creator. And the word was with God. Now, this is very important from the point of view that, as you will see in this paper concerning the thinker and the thought, what they're trying to do is eliminate two beings who are God and say there's only one being who is God by saying that the word was the thought of God. And since he was the thought in the thinker, he was with God. But that's not what this means at all. Because when we get to the detailed study of it, we will see it is with, and the Greek is pros, which means with or toward, face to face. Was with God, and the word was God so that we understand who the one it was that became Jesus Christ. And we will see later in our in-depth study that all of this is, is to counteract and go against all of the philosophical doctrines of the nature of God. When we get there, it's going to open your mind like you have never understood this before. But I want to get it all prepared and laid out word for word so you can see it clearly. I'm currently reading a book by John Goodenow, which is called Light by Light. And, of course, it says a lot about light here, doesn't it, in the first chapter? Yes. And what he's essentially showing is the the pagan's concept of the nature of God. And going through that, I can see, and with what we have in these other papers here, how that they were going absolutely contrary to those religions at that time, which are philosophies which are being resurrected and dumped upon us today. Now, let's notice something else, continuing. The same was in the beginning with God which means he had to be there. Now notice what he did. All things were made by him. You could also translate all things as everything. And without him was not anything made that was made. No such thing as creation by sub-gods. No such thing as creation by angels. No such thing as evolution. All was made by him. Now, let's go to First John, the first chapter, because we want to cover this. And since I said there were three places which talks about the beginning, we want to go ahead and have it in there. Now we're talking about something just a little bit different in relationship to it. We're talking about the one who was from the beginning, and that is after everything was created, the one who became Jesus Christ, as the Lord God of the Old Testament, continually existed from the time of the creation. 
He existed before the creation. He existed after the creation. So that's what he's saying here. And he's giving us a very, very uh, personal account of their relationship with Jesus Christ. That which we have, which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon and our hands have handled the word of life. The life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest unto us, or that is revealed unto us, which we have seen and heard, we declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Hebrews, the first chapter, and we find... Something that adds to this concerning the beginning, concerning God, concerning what he did, concerning what Christ was. We know that in the beginning was God. And we know that the word for God is Elohim. And Elohim is a word which means more than one. So there was a time when there were the two Elohims, and then there was a time when one of them became the Father, and the other became the Son. So Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 1. God, who in sundry times and different manners spoke in the time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So when it says that we are going to be co-heirs with Christ, I don't even think that our minds can grasp the magnitude of what that is going to be because he's the heir of all things. By whom? Now notice, he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So we're dealing with the fact that God is a person, as revealed throughout the scriptures. That's why God wants us to have a personal relationship with him. And with Christ. Now notice this, upholding all things by the word of his power, or by the power of his word. Because God, we will see when he created, when he spoke, it came into existence. And when he had by himself, which we'll have to cover in more detail when we come around to the Passover time again, by himself purged our sins, sat down on the majesty, uh, the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made so much better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than he, than they rather. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. That's when the father became the father. That's when the Elohim who became the Father became the Father. That's when the Elohim who became the Son became the Son. We'll read that again. Verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, You are my Son, this day I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a Father, and he shall be to me a Son. And again, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So this is telling us about the person and the power and the work and the activity of Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to our Hebrew interlinear in Genesis, the first chapter. And so when we are talking about the beginning, it is the beginning, not a. Anything subsequent of the beginning is an addition or a renewal or whatever, but it is not a beginning. 
in the beginning created God, the heavens and the earth. So as I mentioned, the verb comes before the subject. God here being Elohim means more than one. That's why, as we will see a little later, he said, let us. And the earth being a desolation and a waste. Now, how did the earth become a desolation and a waste? Because when he got done creating the earth, it was, he said, behold, it was very good. Let's see how this came to be. Let's first understand that these two words mean, come from the Hebrew, tohu and bohu, you probably heard that before, which means chaos and confusion. Now, is God the author of confusion? No, God is not the author of confusion. We find that in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. You don't have to turn there. You might want to put it in your notes. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. God is not the author of confusion. Now, how did it become this way? Well, the reason is there was something before human beings which was on this earth. That's what happened. So let's look at that. Let's look at the scriptures which help us with this to give us understanding. Let's first of all go to Isaiah, Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, and let's see what Isaiah tell us, tells us concerning God and his creation. Now, as we will, as we're turning to Isaiah 45, you will also note that the King James translation says concerning, in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Now, when we come to Isaiah 45, we have a very interesting and very profound verse. Verse 18, thus says the Lord that created the heavens. Now, we're talking about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God himself formed it, formed the earth, and made it. He established it. He created it not in vain. Told you. It's not in vain. Well, then, how could it become in vain right at the beginning, after God created it, if he didn't make it in vain? or in chaos and confusion. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 4. And we will see another place where the expression tohu and bohu is used. And this will give us an understanding as to how the earth became that way. Now, let's pick it up here in verse, it's talking about the punishment coming to Jerusalem and Judah. It's talking about the things that are, are happening in punishment. Verse 19, uh, Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah says, my bowels, my bowels, I'm pained at my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Now this is going to tell us how the earth became that way and why the earth is so literally upside down. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly my tents are spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are Satish children, and they have, no, they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. 
but to do good they have no knowledge. I beheld, and lo, the earth was without form and void. A condition subsequent to the creation. In this case, a condition subsequent to what we uh, find of the completed creation in Genesis, the first chapter. And this is Tohu and Bohu, or being a desolation and a waste. And that's what war does. Let's ask the question. Was there war in heaven before the creation of man? Because that becomes very important. Let's first of all, Let's first of all go to Genesis, the third chapter, for just a minute, because we want to understand something here. Now, in this case, I'm just going to the King James, because uh, I, I just want to cover one thing here. In all of the account that we have concerning Adam and Eve and the garden and so forth, we have four beings who are noted in the scriptures, correct? Besides all the animals in the creation. Who are those four beings? We have God, we have Adam, we have Eve. Now, then we also have the serpent. The serpent, then, we know is Satan the devil. He's called that old serpent, Satan the devil, which deceives the whole world, Revelation 12, 9. Question. Was Satan already evil by the time he met Adam and Eve? Yes. Which means then he had to become evil and Satan before Adam and Eve were created. Now, when was that and how did that happen? Well, let's look at some scriptures. Let's go to Ezekiel 28, and we will see. Now, Ezekiel 28 is a very interesting chapter, because it talks about the prince of Tyre, it talks about Tyre, and it talks about the king of Tyre, or Tyrus, as it is listed here. But we want to focus in on something that is very important, because this tells us some very important facts. Now, let's read it here. Verse 11, Ezekiel 28. Now, this is very basic, fundamental, but I think it's important that we go through it because, you know, there are some people who are denying that Satan is even a being today, even within the church of God. Ezekiel 28 and verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyrus. Now notice over here, verse 2. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyrus, Because your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God. Well, you can't get any higher than that, can you? No. Why does then he address the king of Tyrus? Because in this case, the king of Tyrus is the spirit power behind the prince who says he's God. And we're going to see that this is the same spirit power that in the book of Revelation inspires the final beast power to say, I am God. And all the world is going to worship him and worship the devil. Now, let's notice what it says about this king of Tyrus, which has to then be the one who became Satan the devil, as we will see, by what the scriptures tell us here. And say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, You seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in the garden in Eden, the garden of God. We have the four identified who were in the garden, correct? God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. What happened after they sinned? 
They were put out of the Garden of Eden, and no one could enter into it, correct? Right. So if he was in Eden, the Garden of God, this could only be talking about the one who became Satan, the devil. Because no one else went into the Garden of Eden after the sin of Adam and Eve. They were cast out, and cherubim were put there with flaming swords to keep the way. So they couldn't go back in there. Now notice we have something here that is important. You were in the Eden, the Garden of God. Then it talks about all of his beauty, all of the tremendous coverings and the stones, which is a sign of regalness and royalty and exalted position. Let's come down here to the last sentence of verse 13. The workmanship of your tabrays and of your pipes were prepared in you in the day that you were created. Now we saw that everything was created by Jesus Christ, correct? Nothing came into existence that he did not make. So we have a created being. Now let's find out a little bit more about him. You are the anointed cherub that covers. Now, we know that over the Ark of the Covenant were two cherubs, correct? Guarding it. Here we find an additional cherub, which has nothing to do with the two cherubs that are over the Ark of the Covenant, nor having anything to do with the two cherubs placed at the gate going into the Garden of Eden. You are the anointed cherub that covers. I have set you so. You were upon the holy mount of God. Now, Garden of Eden was not the holy mount, was it? No. This is talking about a time prior to when the earth became desolate and without form or void or tohu and bohu. I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, showing that he was right there with God. And whatever this this is talking about, the way you could visualize things composed of spirit, this is what it's talking about. Verse 15, you are perfect in your ways from the day that you were created. Now, it doesn't tell us how long the event was until iniquity was found in you. We don't know how long it was. The Bible doesn't tell us. But something happened, and it happened over a period of time. Now, when I was back in Grand Junction, I was given this little saying by Carl Quist. So I entitled it an old proverb, and this is true. You don't go bad in a single day. You just sort of shuffle along. Then lighten the load of your moral code till you don't know right from wrong. And I thought that was a very nice little proverb, but it's the same way with Satan the devil, same way with the one who was the covering cherub, right over the throne of God. Now let's notice what happened. Till iniquity was found in him, which shows us that there had to be a period of time. There had to be an activity by the angels. Angels do not exist just to pluck on harps. Angels were greater in power and ability than human beings. So I have to ask the question, what kind of civilization did the angels have before they fell? We don't know, but it had to be greater than ours because they had greater abilities. But notice what it says, by the multitude of your merchandise. So I don't know what it, what it was that they were doing. But what is it that Satan is inspiring the whole world to do today? To buy and sell and trade and merchandise. 
Is that what he did with the angels also, and then do it illegally? Do it improperly? Could very well be. They have filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. And sin is the transgression of the laws and commandments of God. Do you not suppose that there are commandments for angels that they have to obey? If you have righteous angels, are they not obedient angels? If you have disobedient angels who have become demons, then you have to also apply the principle if you don't believe that there are laws and commandments for angels to follow. What is that principle? Where there is no law, there is no sin. So he could not have sinned unless there was some law that he broke or commandment that he broke. And we're going to see what that was in just a little bit here. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and you have corrupted your wisdom by the reason of your brightness, got totally sold on himself. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled your sanctuary. So there must have been some form of angelic worship with sanctuaries, with what we might call assemblies or churches. Now, we have to deduce that from here, because you cannot have a sanctuary unless there's some place that's set aside to be holy, can you? You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore, I will bring a fire from the midst of you, and I will devour you and bring you down to ashes upon the earth in sight of all of them that behold you. So then it carries forth right from there to the final final punishment of Satan the devil. Now let's go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And this tells us what occurred. And then we'll go from there to the book of Jude and then to the book of Isaiah. Revelation 12. Now, let's understand something concerning fallen angels, which are called demons. Revelation 12, because there is going to be a future war. And that future war is going to result in, again, the casting down of Satan the devil to the earth, which is just somewhere in the very near future ahead of us. Now, let's read verse 9 first so we can understand something with him something about this. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Now, what happened when he was cast out the first time? This is the second casting out, as we will see. The first one was a fall. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which is deceiving the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Those angels are called in the Gospels demons or unclean spirits. Now, we've seen in the past that sin causes uncleanness, spiritual and physical. Now, let's go back. Let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, this is symbolic of the whole completed work of God with the bride of Christ. This is depicting the woman, the bride of Christ. Clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in pain, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, which we saw was Satan the devil, having seven heads and ten horns, so we have the powers and principalities, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. When did that happen? 
That's the question now we need to ask. This first fall, when did that happen? Let's go to Luke 10. And let's see what Jesus said. Luke 10. Let's see what Jesus said concerning Satan and the demons. Because this is also a very revealing scripture. Luke 10 and verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons, now the King James says devils, but that should be demons, are subject to us through your name. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. That's what we just read in Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4 there, correct? And he drew a third part of the stars of heaven with him. We know that in Revelation, the first chapter, it tells us that a star is an angel. So this is saying, uh, combined together, that when Satan fell as lightning from heaven, he drew a third of the angels with him. Now, let's confirm that by this scripture in Jude, the little book of Jude, please. Let's turn there, just one little chapter. And that's why it's only the verses. And let's see what Jude wrote concerning the angels and see what he says about them. Book of Jude, last one before the book of Revelation. 